In this video, we are doing a Hobie Compass review. We've got our hands on the latest model. We're gonna talk about how it performs in good weather and bad weather, its strengths, its weaknesses. We'll compare it to other Hobies on the market so that you have an idea about whether this kayak is suited for you or not. Let's get into it. So in terms of kayak reviews on this channel, the Hobie Compass is probably one that has been missing. It's been a bit of a, a void there. So we've got our hands on the latest version, the 2021 model in slate blue. Done a couple of things to it, we'll talk about that. But we have had it on the water in good weather, in bad weather. I've had it in two tournaments that have included pre-fishes and day ones and day twos. So we've spent some serious time in the kayak now and we are going to talk about how all of that went. We'll talk about how it handled the, that bad weather and how it was really tested its strengths, some of the weaknesses for it as well. We'll compare it with the Hobie Kayak range also. So we'll put it up against the Outback, the PA, the Passport, and talk about some of the characteristics it's got. In particular, the Revo nose that's in there that really makes some things shine in this kayak. Importantly though, it is kind of vanilla. So there's some things that I'm gonna talk about that you're gonna to need to do to your compass to make it really shine. And hopefully you walk away with a bit of an idea about who this kayak is suited for. We'll get into that in a bit, but first of all, this is what the kayak looks like on the water. So quick couple of disclosures here. So for those of you that are new to the channel, we do not have a, an affiliation with Hobie. So the opinions that you're gonna hear in the channel are mine. I do have an affiliation with Hunter Water Sports who hooked us up with this kayak. So a big thank you to them to help me produce the content for you guys. When I told them that I wanted to do a Hobie Compass review, those guys said we'll do a couple of deals and we'll get in contact with Burley Pro who also helped this channel. And they've got a bit of a deal going on the Hobie Compass on the backside of this video. We'll talk about that in a moment, but the opinions in it are mine. I bought this kayak. I am technically now a Hobie Compass owner. I will be getting rid of it though, because I've got a 360 on the way. So let's have a look at this kayak on the water. I think one of the fundamental things to do though first is to understand the hull shape and how the kayak has actually been made. I spoke to Hobie really quickly here about this and they did mention that the nose has been taken off the Hobie Revo and or the Revolution and the rear has been modeled off the Hobie Pro Angler. So what you end up there is a really sharp nose and a big fat behind. Now that immediately clues us in into what type of kayak this might be and who it's designed for. So let's start at the nose. If you haven't heard of the Revo before, the Revo is very much the Hobie seagoing in weather specialist. It's designed to ride waves and take weather. Unlike the Hobie Outback on the other hand though, that is designed to be longitudinally stable and it will just nose through and kind of try and part waves if you like, rather than ride them out like this Revo nose does on the compass. I had this kayak in like 25 to 30 knot gusts, maybe pushing 30, not nothing over that, but I had it in the rain, I had it in the waves, and I gotta tell you, this kayak is awesome in the weather. Here's some footage of the nose and you'll see what I mean. You can appreciate that I'm hunting for bad weather here and I'm hunting for the waves. I'm gonna hit them at high speed uh, just to show you how the kayak kind of handles itself. But 
I was really, really surprised at how it went. So it's also got these sunken areas next to the drive though that will divert and flush water straight down the Mirage Drive well if it does get in there and it'll go straight back into the sea, which is really cool. I think out of the MD180 Pro Angler, the Passport 10 and a half, 12, the Outback, the Hobie Compass was actually the most comfortable in bad weather that I have been in. Now the Hobie 360 is probably another another beast. It did, does catch a lot of wind like a big sail, but you can rotate the nose straight in and out of the winds. So the Hobie Compass is probably the best in terms of the forward and reverse star kayaks in bad weather. The final thing I mentioned about the nose is that you do end up getting a bit of a seesaw motion on the kayak because the kayak rides above the waves as opposed to plowing through it. It does take about a session to get used to. It's not significant at all, but just appreciate that the compensation for you to go over the waves is that you're gonna do a bit more riding of the wave as opposed to plowing the wave like you do get in the outback. So as we mentioned earlier, the backside of the kayak is a little bit wider and pro angler like. It's not as big as a pro angler, but it does feel as though it's a little bit chunky when you compare it to the nose. And that chunkiness I reckon is a good thing, but it also means that you can store your live well fully rigged with fish in it, or your gear, your competition or tournament style rigs, and it never really feels overloaded. It's got a lot of buoyancy back there, and in terms of storage capacity, it's really nice. It's worth mentioning also, after I did my 2021 Hobie Outback review that I'll, I'll throw a link up there if you're interested in, but I got a call from a mate of mine that basically said, look, that kayak is awesome. It's feature rich, it's great. But if you're a large guy and you buy the Outback, you might actually be better suited for the compass. Those were his words. And I kind of get what he's talking about after using both of them. When I'm sitting in the Outback, I really noticed that my Mirage Drive feet foot position was at around about the four, five, six kind of area. When I was in the compass, it sat at two. So I was much further rearward in my pedals. It basically meant that if you're a larger guy, there's a lot more pedal area for your feet to sit and you can stretch out just a little bit more. I certainly felt that in the seat as well. I don't know whether the Outback seat is technically larger than the Compass seat, but when I was looking at the Compass seat, I definitely felt as though there was more room in the Compass seat itself. And like I said before, when it was fully rigged, I had all my gear in it, I was tournament ready, I had the 30 litres or 35 litres of water, however much the live oil takes, it did not feel overloaded one bit. Now, speaking of storage though, it does get a bit of a hit that I'll talk about in a minute, but out of the bubble wrap as a stock mode kind of kayak, the storage in this kayak is probably not good enough. You're gonna to need to do some stuff. We'll talk about that in a sec, but it is a consideration. So we're gonna talk about a direct comparison with the Compass versus the other model Hobies that are out there. Because it does beat it in price, it's one of the cheaper models in the range and it should be, but not because of performance. I reckon its biggest competitor has got to be the Hobie Outback. Now the Compass is about 800 US cheaper than the Outback, we'll explain why that is in a sec, but the Outback is meant to be Hobie's best selling kayak. After using both of them, I don't know whether that should be the case. So in terms of price, this is where the Compass sits. Rightfully, it's more expensive than the Passports that are two bits of plastic that are glued together, European made, versus the one molded plastic that Hobie make in their factory where they spin all the plastic and everything is, you know, one piece and cocoon straight out. On the other space though, it is rightfully cheaper than the Outback. If you're unfamiliar with the Outback, Hobie went full send on the Outback with all the features that they incorporated, you know, little bungee cords, molded bits, you know, holders, rails, hay trails. They doubled up on most things and tripled up on others. And it's, a, it's actually a really nice kayak, but it is more expensive. It is arguable though, whether the normal Joe Blow needs all of that gear on a kayak. So in terms of underwater performance though, turning circles in particular, it does beat the Battleship MD-180 Hobie Pro Angler 12 and 14. It beats the Hobie Passport 10 and a half and 12. But surprisingly, it beat the Outback. 
and it beat the Outback by a long way. I'm gonna cut away to some side by side here, but that Hobie Outback that my friend is sitting in has an upgraded rudder. It's got a sailing rudder in it, and it's got the upgraded Mirage Drive, the turbo fins in there as well. Mine was taken straight out of the box that morning. Now, you will see here that I have to stop pedaling or else I'm gonna collide with him. And I reach, I guess, my 360 much earlier than he does. We did this about three or four times. I don't have the best footage for you on it. I reckon it is about 20% better in terms of turn rates on the compass than it is the Outback. It blew me away, I did not expect that, but it is evident and it is there for everybody to see. So that trait is gonna be really handy for you if you are considering fishing tight structure, whether it's oyster leases or racks, pontoons, or making your way around pads or flats and avoiding that weed. In terms of top speed, because the turbo fins match, it is about the same as the Outback. Where it does differ though, is the effort it takes to get to top speed. To quantify that, and I've written it down here, so let me just go to my notes. It was about three and a half knots comfortably without much effort, that's 6.6 Ks an hour or four mile an hour. Around about that, with around about that 70%, 60 to 70% effort just cruising around. If I wanted to exert myself and get to top speed, I got to four knots, seven and a half K an hour, or about 4.6 mile an hour. And I'd say those speeds are comparable to the Outback as well. It's just that the effort I used to get to those speeds was much less. So let's talk about the compass off the water. Now, one of the great advantages of this compass, and maybe even the Outback as well, is that they are car toppable. I mean, you can do that with the Pro Angler as well, but you know, the Pro Angler, in my opinion, you're really starting to think trailer or loading system. With the compass, you get away with not using that. I got away with it just having on the top of my car for the six, seven odd sessions that I've had it out so far, and it's been great. It's been really convenient to not have to trailer anything around. So I'm gonna go back to this diagram here, but the compass itself, it sits at 31 kilo or 68 pound, which is why you can pick it up and move it around. And we're talking empty hull weights here, so what it would look like sitting on top of your car. The Hobie Revo 13 is at 32 kilo or 70 pound. The Outback, surprisingly, 38 kilo or 85 pound. The PA12 is 55 kilo, 120 pound. The 14 is 56 and a half kilo or 124 pound. So you're not particularly far away from half the weight of a PA14, that is what a compass weighs. It's significant, and that kind of ties into what I was talking about before. To get your PA14 to the same speed, the effort has to be more, because you're simply pushing more hull. So in terms of off the water, transport, interoperability with your home, requirement to buy a trailer, the compass actually gets a few giant ticks from me for those reasons. So big shout out to HWS and Burley Pro for always supporting the channel. I really appreciate that. They've actually got a bit of a deal going for you guys if you are in the market for a Hobie Compass. The first five guys that go through HWS are gonna get a Burley Pro specific pack that I'll talk about in a sec, but you're gonna get that for free included in your sale. There's a fair bit of money in there as well, which I think is pretty cool. When you're making the purchase from HWS, all you need to do is mention this video. So what's in it? You're gonna get included a Burley Pro Bumper Bro. Now it's valued at $39. It will protect the nose and make sure that it takes the being on the concrete, on the rocks, and your kayak stays basically integrity free and scratch free. You're also gonna get a $49 Bucket Bro in there and that'll increase your rectangular storage area so you can drop in tackle boxes, all the gear. I'm a big fan of that. Next, you're gonna get the Compass Seat Risers. They're valued at $95, but they increase the amount of storage underneath the seat. I'm about to talk about one of the weaknesses of the kayak, but this solves the storage issue weakness that I'll talk about in a sec. You get a 25 mil jig bucket that screws into the side there and increases some storage for you, as well as on the other side, a side B $49 side bro. Again, another quick access item for you. Now, if you come across this video in a little while and you aren't one of the five guys, that whole kit will be on the HWS Online website at a discounted rate total. So check that out. I'll throw the links below there. You can ultimately save a bit of money. So 
lastly, let's talk about some of the features on the kayak. Like I mentioned a few times, we are fitted for, I guess, but not with, and there's some things that we need to make uh, changes to on this kayak to make it really shine as a feasible and really strong performing kayak. It is a bit of a blank canvas. Now, the first thing that I'll talk about, and I do have mentioned a number of times on this channel about other kayaks is this accessory rail system. If you've seen my videos, you know you're a big, I'm a big fan of them because you do avoid drilling into the kayak. The less drilling that you can do in a kayak, the better. They're really easy ways to mount your graph or your sounder. All you need to do is get the mount, slot it in the slide, slide it to where you want it, and then rotate to lock. Super handy, no damage to the kayak, and no leaking. So that's a good thing. On the other side in the constructive space is the seat height. Now, Hobie have mounted the seat, I reckon, about an inch too low. Inconveniently, it means that you cannot fit a tackle box under the seat frame like you can in other Hobie models. If you do manage to get something under there though, and you're over about 160 pounds, well, the seat is going to bow and you'll end up sitting on the item. You know, there's a bit of suspension in that netting. So uh, if you go too low, you will sit on the tackle box or whatever it is that you fit under your seat. In comes the Burley Pro seat risers that solve that problem by lifting the seat about three quarters of an inch. Now, realistically, it's enough for you to solve that problem and get multiple tackle boxes and gear underneath your seat without both you sitting on them and the simple fact that they can actually fit under the frame. On the positive side, the carry handles in this kayak are actually awesome. I really never liked those flimsy outside handles that you see on the Outback, the Passport, some of the cheaper models. Uh, these ones are molded in. It really feels like when you're grabbing the kayak on top of your car, it feels like you've got a good hold of it. The grip is really firm whenever you're launching or unloading, it's really nice. Again, on the constructive side, the steering handles here aren't great. Now, I know this is a cheaper version of the Hobie molded series, but we're now paying a fair bit of money for our Hobie Compass. If Hobie want to charge a premium, they need to deliver a premium product. And what I'm talking about here is dual steering on both sides. The Hobie Outback has got dual steering. The Hobie Compass has got left-hand side only. I'd say if the 2022 model of the Compass did not have dual steering on it, it would be a bit of a disappointment and a bit of a fail in my opinion. But you'll also see that I don't have a lot of footage of the stock Hobie handle in there because I've come from a PA kind of mindset and I really do like to hold my handles whenever I'm moving them around with the handle in the, in the web of or the palm of my hand. So I went for the Burley Pro upgraded aluminium handle. You'll know that this one doesn't look like the other ones that are on the market because it is a tester. It is actually going on the Hobie Outback uh, that handle, but it is a high profile. If you want the low profile one, the aluminium handles come in the low profile also. My point here wasn't to upsell you on Burley Pro steering handles or anything. It was to really reinforce the concept that I really don't like the idea that you're paying a certain premium amount and you're only getting a steering handle on one side. I guess back in the day, the Outback was like that too. So uh, maybe it's time for a bit of development there, but I do think that you're paying enough for you to be able to afford, or for Hobie or someone to be able to afford a second dual steering handle on both sides. 100%, you need to get rid of that circular hatch that is in the center of the kayak. I mean, the center hatch is great, but it's really tough to fit any tackle box or any gear through those circular holes. You see them on cheaper kayaks, and there's a reason that they're used on cheaper kayaks. It's a cheaper hatch. But when you consider the total cost that you're putting into this kayak, it's not a very big leap to then purchase a rectangular hatch. You can see we went for the longer folding one. You can go for the, sh the one that folds on the long side or the short side, but the rectangular, in my opinion, that rectangular center area is a must. The best part about that rectangular storage is that not only do you open up the area that's middle, immediately in front of you, you actually now have a free center hatch that you can move to the front. And you'll see that there's a mold up the front of the compass that is designed to take that center hatch. It's kind of like Hobie knew that you would want to make this upgrade and catered for it. So that circular area there is easy to cut out and you just uh, punch the hatch in and drill it in. It's really not a difficult upgrade to do. So as I wrap this feature bit up and we talk about some of the upgrades, let's be realistic. A lot of the stuff that we've talked about isn't gonna cost you an arm and a leg to upgrade. If you have the Outback, you go the Outback option, you're gonna do half of this stuff anyway.
truthfully, after looking at all that stuff we just did, I'm really surprised by the Hobie Compass for the price point and its affordability. I reckon it's probably the best value kayak that Hobie have on the market. To the point where I'm actually considering canceling my 2021 PA360 order. Yes, I'll still do that so I can do the review and whatnot, and that'd be great, but in terms of a kayak that I want, I know with this compass, I don't have to manage a trailer and trailer insurance and fuel economy on my, on my car. I know that I can go to a tournament somewhere that's a 15 to 12 hour drive away, tow my bass boat behind me and have my kayak on the roof, and things just get pretty effortless. And while we're talking about effortless, think about the speed that I was talking about before and the effortless it is to move around this kayak. The big question though, do I think the Compass is a better kayak than the Outback? No, I think they are on par. Some people will see suit the Compass better than the Outback or the Outback better than the Compass. Do I think the Compass though is better value for money? Yes, by a long way. I hope you enjoyed the video, stay safe, I'll see you next time. <gasps> that fish is a giant fish.